Thanks. All right, let's uh, go ahead and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We have Maxime Beauchemont, uh, CEO and founder of Presets. Uh, welcome, Maxime. Thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who are just uh, getting into our session, there will be a Q&A at the end. And if we are not able to get into your question, please make sure to join the Slack community and we will be able to have Maxime for an hour and he can answer your questions there. So with that, it is top of the hour. Uh, take it away, dive in, Maxime. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so, so today, so my name is Max, I'm, uh, and today I'm talking about uh, functional data engineering and talking a set uh, about a set of uh, best back, best practices that are that are related to this topic. Um, I'm going to be drawing some uh, some parallel between uh, functional programming and and uh, this approach for uh, data engineering. Cool. So. Um, a little bit of context for the talk. So before I jump in and start talking about functional programming and how it relates to data engineering, I uh, wanted to, to give um, some context. The first uh, item is about me. Uh, so a tiny bit about me. Um, so at this point in my career, I think I'm best known for uh, being the original creator of Apache Superset, which is a data visualization uh, and, and exploration platform and Apache Airflow. Um, that is a, an, an orchestrator for for batch jobs. So it's this it's it's this workflow or orchestrator um, for batch jobs. Recently, I started um, a company called Preset. So uh, so it's been already a year and a half or so. And Preset is offering hosted, improved um, Apache Superset uh, as a service. A little bit more on that later. Um, I come from a bunch of data driven companies. So. Uh, last, I was at Lyft. Before that, I was at Airbnb, Facebook, uh, Facebook, Ubisoft, and Yahoo. So I've been working uh, as part of modern data teams that uh, that I've been using, you know, data lakes uh, for for quite some time now. So, um, so so that's the little bit about me. Um, a little bit about Superset. So it would be hard to talk about me without talking about Apache Superset. Uh, Superset is a Data viz, um, data visualization exploration uh, consumption platform that I started while I was at Airbnb and back in 2015, uh, and recently, you know, with Preset, we're putting a lot of steam behind the project, and the the project is really accelerating in all sorts of ways. So if, if you haven't checked out Apache Superset, um, or you haven't checked it out in a while, I would really uh, urge you to go uh, and check out the the project. Um, I'll be on Slack later too. So if you have questions related to, to superset data visualization, I'll be happy to talk about that. Uh, but the topic of today is not that, it's functional data engineering. Cool, so more context on the talk. So uh, this fits, this talk fits uh, kind of on top of a uh, blog post that I wrote about two years ago, I think, called Functional Data Engineering, a Modern Paradigm for D Batch Data Processing. Um, so you can kind of, think of that blog post as supporting material for this talk today. So if you want to learn more or uh, kind of digest it in the, in the more um, blog post type format, you can revisit this later. Uh, that's the third of a little bit of a trilogy of blog posts that I wrote. One was uh, the rise of the data engineer. Uh, so that's already uh, four or five years old, but I think it's still very relevant today. So it's really talking about the role of the data engineer and what they do and what this is all about, where they fit in as part of modern data teams. And uh, and I followed it by the downfall of the data engineer that talks more about like what's really hard and challenging um, about being a data engineer. So um, a few blog posts for more context. Uh, also, context on this talk is that this is kind of old news. So first, this talk is a recycled talk from about two years ago, and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna update it in, in all sorts of ways and, and really put more of the uh, data lake uh, kind of centric aspect and perspective here today. Uh, but it's also the methodology that I'm talking about today, which is applying some concept from from functional programming to data engineering is not new at all. When I joined Facebook in 2012, they were already you know, heavily using um, a data lake uh, and, and the, method, the methodologies that I'll reference uh, as part of this talk. 
Cool. So functional programming. So before I get into data engineering, I just want to do a very, very short crash course and a, 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 a refresher for people that are already familiar with uh, functional programming to set the context. In the second phase, I'm going to talk about uh, more directly about the parallels between the two, right? Uh, so let's start with functional programming. So without reading the Wikipedia uh, definition here that I have, um, I want to just to, to just point out that functional programming is a different paradigm. So it's a programming paradigm uh, as opposed to say object oriented programming. So it's a different way to organize and structure your code. Uh, and, and essentially it's an approach that's very coming from uh, the function being at the foundation of, uh, of the way you structure and organize things. Um, I'll talk about three kind of core principles of uh, functional programming. One is the idea of pure functions. So in functional programming, you author functions that are pure. And what does that mean? That means that uh, those functions uh, don't have side effects. So that means that if you give the same input to the function, you're guaranteed to get the exact same output. This is nice because this is it makes it easier to uh, reason about these function. Uh, they can be e easily unit tested uh, and it brings kind of clarity to the process in general. Um, so here I have a little bit of, of an example, like the, the probably the simplest code I could write to kind of demonstrate a pure function versus an impure function. Uh, so you can tell very easily that the pure one, the pure add one function is always going to give the same result. And, um, and in the case of the second, uh, impure add one, you know, you, you know that you're going to get a different result every time you call it, regardless of the parameters that you pass or you, you don't pass to it. When you think about it, uh, 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 object oriented programming, uh, you know, uh, as part of its core, the, the idea is to write setter functions that will mutate your objects, right? So clearly, um, it's a completely different approach. Um, now, talking about immutability, so it's the Another fu uh, fundamental concept in functional programming is that your objects are uh, thought of as immutable. So once you affect a variable with an object or, or, or with uh, a piece of data, this piece of data uh, won't change unless you affect it to another variable. So uh, this uh, can, can create, you know, changes the paradigm in all sorts of ways and changes the patterns uh, that you're going to use on top of it. But it's a nice uh, guarantee that you have as a programmer. You'll see that once something has been affected in a certain scope, it won't change. And that, that provides a set of guarantees that you can build upon. Now there's the concept of idempotency, which is very relevant to data engineering. I'll draw some parallel, uh, some parallels later. But idempotence, to, to read this quick definition or part of it, uh, is the property of certain operations uh, that, in, in a way that they can be applied uh, multiple times without changing the result beyond the initial application. So it's this idea that if you rerun a job or a function uh, for, given a certain state, if you do this idempotent operation, it will bring you consistently to that uh, to that same state, right? So it provides some really nice guarantees that are uh, super nice to have for different reasons uh, from the data engineering perspective. Now, before uh, jumping into functional data engineering, I want to say like I expose here some really core um, kind of principles or, or, or some some core ideas behind functional programming. I think what's really interesting about functional programming I didn't talk about is the patterns that emerge based on these kind of constraints and guarantees. Uh, and I won't talk about that today because I could be talking about that um, all day. And then we're pivoting to talking more about uh, to, to talking more about data engineering and how some of these concepts can be brought into this world um, and, and create some clarity. By the way, I think I realized later on that, uh, you know, so, so I think my, my history around this topic is I was doing data engineering for a very long time. Uh, I was kind of applying functional paradigm to data engineering without necessarily uh, realizing it until I started learning about functional programming down the line in my career and, and kind of put the two together and be like, oh, well, th these two things, uh, that's kind of, I've been applying a lot of these principles for a while. Uh, so I, I kind of 
um, brought this like idea, the, the link between the two. Um, as I was progressing kind of on both sides of like software engineering and as a data engineer. So I want to talk briefly about reproducibility as something that's really important in data engineering uh, and in, in data processing in general, right? Uh, uh, reproducibility is foundational to the scientific method, right? If you can't reproduce results consistently, you haven't made progress or science has not made progress. Um, Reproducibility is critical from a legal standpoint, right? If you have an audit and you're publishing some numbers, you're a public or private company and you put some data forward uh, and you take important decisions based on this data, it's important to be able to explain how you got there and, to, and the only way to, uh, to do that is by being able to reproduce the same results as you've gotten before. Uh, more fundament, uh, fundamentally, too, I think uh, reproducibility is critical from a sanity standpoint, right? If you're a data engineer working all day, running jobs, authoring jobs, uh, troubleshooting jobs, if you cannot have this guarantee that by rerunning a job, you'll get to the same results, uh, you're, gonna, you're just going to go crazy. Um, so I think it's important from that, that perspective. And the idea here is that the functional approach that I'm going to be talking about today uh, generally um, if you play by those rules, you can guarantee that reproducibility. So I talked about immutability and variables on the functioning fu functional programming side. Now I'm going to talk about uh, immutable partitions as the atomic block of computation or, or of data in a data lake, right? So if you use, um, you know, HDFS S3 and something like Hive Presto, uh, Dremio, right? These databases operate on a lake and, and operate uh, very much at the block level, right? And by block, uh, I, I'm thinking about block like partition, right? A partition is a atomic unit of a, of a table of a mutation in, a, uh, in one of these like modern databases that work on a lake, usually with Parquet files or RC files. Um, so I, uh, one recommendation around around like how to implement functional uh, data engineering is to systematically partition all tables. So you don't want to mutate your tables. You want to append new partitions to your table, right? You think of your table as something that is made out of blocks and consistently as you process your data, you would be adding on new partitions. If you need to change the source data or the nature of a computation, you will have to rerun your data and then mutate the partitions that are affected by, by the change. But in general, it brings a lot of clarity to partition the tables and operate uh, at that level. Um, there's this idea too of having one task or one job in your batch processing framework that lines up with one, par uh, with one partition and that brings a lot of clarity. Um, there's this idea too that if you are uh, writing once and reading multiple times, which is uh, typical of data warehousing and, and uh, analytics type workload, then you can do that. You can pay that price kind of uh, in a more expensive way where you, you create something like a parquet file, like an RC file uh, to create something that is intended uh, to be fast on read, maybe a little bit more expensive to write, but, uh, but, cheaper to read as a result. And when you think about that, your ETL, conceptually, while you might think of your ETL uh, and your workflows and your batch processing workflow as a lineage of tables, right? Like tables kind of go flowing into other tables. Then you can start thinking about your ETL like it's a DAG of partitions, right? So each partition has its own lineage pointing to other partitions as kind of demonstrated in the diagram here. Uh, so I'm not gonna go too deep in this diagram here, but having this idea of having a low complexity score for each partition brings a lot of clarity because you, you, you know where the data is coming from and you know that you can only reprocess the chunks that you need to reprocess without having to mutate, um, mutate entire tables. Great, so uh, now pure ETL tasks, right? So this is akin to the pure uh, functions and functional programming. 
it's this idea that you create when you write an ETL job, uh, whether it's an Airflow job or a Luigi job or, or a Dremio kind of transformation package, uh, you want for these jobs to be idempotent. So that means if if they fail halfway, um, or if you need to rerun them for a reason or another, um, you know you can rerun them, and that's a great guarantee to have for the operators of the distributed processing system, right? Or even for the data engineers that will say, I didn't get quite the result that I wanted. I need to change the source data, the computation. Now I, I know I can rerun uh, the task and get to the same state. They are deterministic, right? Uh, these tasks, so that means like given the same input, in this case, partitions, they will output the same partitions. Uh, they have no side effects. So that means you're not, you know, adding into counters, you're not appending, you're not deleting. Um, they usually target a single partition. So I think that that's a really core principle that, that makes reasoning about, um, about your, your batch data processes, having a clear, like this task loads into this table and this task instance loads into this partition brings a lot of clarity to, uh, to the process. And when I said like, we don't do mutations, uh, when you think about what Fundamentally, uh, what uh, an update, uh, uh, thinking about like the DML, the data modification language, right, as statements like update, upserts, append, delete. Uh, these operations are mutational by definition, by nature. So what we generally do, or what we recommend to do uh, uh, in regard to this approach is to always do insert override partition. So you're always inserting in a new partition or you're rewriting the whole partition. Uh, you won't go and delete and append and, and insert uh, just a new row to the partition, right? And that fits nicely with the idea of a data lake where um, the blocks, the unit, the unit of uh, atomicity of mutation is not a row like in this uh, traditional OLTP database, but much more a block of data uh, or a partition. Uh, and then generally it's a good it's, it's a good practice too, to have tasks that limit the number of source partition that they scan. Um, I could get a lot deeper into this. Maybe we'll save some for some of this for the Q and A. Uh, people wanna ask questions on this, on this topic, but it goes to the complexity score. If you have a, a partition uh, to compute this partition, you need to scan a wide number of partitions. That means that if you change any of the source partition in theory, you have to recompute it. So you, you really wanna limit the complexity score of your partitions and um, how many kind of blocks they depend on. Maybe a parallel to uh, function to functional programming here would be like you don't want to have a function that receives too many parameters because it's very uh, it's harder to reason about and it's more likely you more likely to have to rerun it if any of the parameters uh, change. Um, here's an Another idea that, that comes from uh, more or less this, this idea of functional, uh, functional data engineering. So assuming that you have all of your raw data, and, and this is what I mean by a persistent staging area, the staging area being the place in the data warehouse where you bring your raw ingredients and your raw data from your external systems, right? So that might be database scrape, your events, uh, kind of pipelines lending into, uh, into your data lake. Uh, so the idea here is to create a persistent staging area where your data lands consistently and that you can trust that the data there will never change. Uh, un unless uh, maybe something went wrong and you need to change it, but you have this persistent staging where that doesn't change. Uh, and what's nice is if you have all of your computation and all of your raw data, you know that you can rebuild the data warehouse at will. Right, like when I'm talking about reproducibility before, um, knowing yet you know your computation, you know your raw data, you can get to the target state that you want, and and that's a that's a great thing for reproducibility, and it's generally a nice uh, a nice piece of foundation to have and to build upon. Uh, also, the fact that you know nowadays I think they in data warehousing. You know, 10, 15 years ago, people might argue like, do you want a persistent or a transient staging area? Uh, now that data is so cheap to store, storage is so cheap, there's no reason why you shouldn't do um, and have a persistent staging area. 
All right, so here, this is the section of the talk, and this is a, a condensed version of a talk that was longer. I believe it was a 45 minutes talk, so I'm gonna have to zip through this fairly quickly if we wanna have time for Q&A. And I invite people to, um, to direct me to some of these topics during Q&A. So I will brush off uh, some of these sections quickly uh, and let's revisit them um, on demand. There's supporting material uh, you know, in the blog post that I mentioned earlier. So I encourage you to look at the blog post if you wanna dig deeper into these challenges. So here is, the, the idea here is to, to talk about some, some core data engineering uh, kind of problem and how to solve them using uh, you know, essentially partitions and functional data engineering principle. The first one is this idea of slowly changing dimensions. Um, this is a term that data engineers uh, may or may not be familiar with, uh, but there's been a fair amount of literature written on this and there's tooling as shown in the, the little diagrams there. I think we see SSIS, Informatica, uh, and data stage here kind of showing a workflow of what, uh, what, how to create a workflow that deals with um, capturing history in a slowly changing dimension. Here, I'm not gonna get too deep into this because I wanna save uh, time for Q&A, but uh, essentially here in, in what you'll find in the blog post is I, I describe what a slowly changing dimension is uh, and what the traditional approaches for these slowly changing dimension have been over time and how to approach this from a functional standpoint. And uh, the, the clear, the, 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 the short story here is to snapshot the data, right? So when you load a, a dimension table, the idea being to create a full snapshot of the dimension. In this case, it could be, uh, let's take an example, like the user table or the supplier table. Um, so every day as you load up and you know new customer come in or some customer change uh, state, location, uh, you you would instead of like kind of mutating this table and adding multiple records to uh, to reflect the different changes in a customer's uh, history of attributes, you would instead kind of create a full snapshot every time. And what I'm showing with the SQL here is that uh, using this very simple principle of snapshotting the data, you can easily to get to you know what is the latest attribute for this customer or what was the attribute uh, of that uh, of that entity at the time of the uh, the event? Sorry to kind of blaze through this. Um, another topic that is typically challenging for in, around immutability um, it, for data engineering is late arriving facts. So here I, I talk about an approach uh, of of partitioning based on event time. Uh, 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 instead of partitioning on event time, partitioning on uh, event processing time and keeping this other dimension of the, the event time uh, as independent from it. There's much more to talk about here. I invite you to ask questions at Q&A or on Slack uh, or to visit the blog post to, um, to learn a little bit more about this. Um, here I'm talking about this idea of self-dependency or past dependency. Uh, so that's the general idea that if you were to build a, your, your, your user dimension based on yesterday's one plus dimension, then you have uh, a much more uh, high complexity score. And that's not desirable uh, in general because any change in history would be very prohibitive. It's really hard to recompute things from scratch because you, would have, you have to compute sequentially um, you know, a series of things you can't, uh, you can't do like parallel processing and for backfills and things like that. So generally here making the point that we encourage people to have an approach uh, that does not use past partitions to create um, current or future partitions. And there are ways around that. Um, happy to get deeper into this. Here, I wanted to mention file explosion as a byproduct of this. So um, when I was at Airbnb, we used HDFS as the backend for our data lake and uh, the name node was quite uh, an issue there because we use partitioning so heavily with this approach. Uh, the good news is that if you use uh, things like S3, GCS or Dremio, that's typically not a problem because they deal very well with the fact that you're gonna have a lot of partitions and a lot of files in your lake. 
Um, so something to mention, but not necessarily a, um, a real problem anymore, depending on your context. So to conclude and leave a little bit of time for Q&A, I wanted to make the point that times have changed quite a bit. And uh, you know, before I was a data engineer, before the term data engineer existed, uh, I was a data warehouse architect and I read the, the Bibles of, of this, uh, which were written by the two grandfathers of uh, data warehousing, so Raph Kimball, Bill Inman. Uh, those books are still relevant in a lot of ways, but I think times have changed and some of the, the design principles and patterns that they put forward uh, are not uh, are not as relevant anymore. Th things have changed. Uh, we have limitless cheap storage. Uh, we have distributed databases. We have decoupled compute and storage. We've seen the rise of a read optimized store that use immutable file formats, right? Uh, and instead of having one big change that, change that we've seen is instead of having a uh, few data specialists really kind of doing the data strategy and processing for the whole company. Now we have very large data teams. Everyone is a data professional, data worker inside companies now. So I think these books uh, need to be rewritten in some ways. Our new generation of books need to come out. And I'm hoping uh, you know, functional engineering is, is, uh, comes to mind in future books, future patterns. So uh, last comment. Uh, these are, uh, I think rules are good to learn, but they're meant to be broken. That is true from the core principle of data warehousing that also applies to functional data engineering as I present it here. Um, so learn the rule, but please go and break them when it makes sense. Like this is not, uh, you know, is, those are just guiding principles. And that's it. So I would like to open up for a Q&A. We have four minutes left. I apologize. I wanted to have more time for Q&A. I'll be on Slack uh, answering questions for the next hour at least. So please uh, hit me up and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Max. Appreciate a great presentation. Lots of kudos here in the announcements. Um, for our viewers, we are open for open uh, Q&A. You can just click the button um, in your upper right-hand corner to share your audio and video, and you'll automatically be put in a queue. So if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and Max is available. Please pass it to Max. What's his view of Apache Iceberg? We've got that written in there. Yeah, so um, I don't know the latest about it. I know the core principles. Um, I love Iceberg. I think that there's a really cool idea that, you know, a transaction in a data lake type data warehouse uh, mutates, you know, a certain number of blocks or partition and the idea that you're able, you know, with, with something like Iceberg, you're able to kind of have these different epochs and keep history of, of you know, different points in time. So the, the idea of like the time traveling debugger that we have in Redux uh, on the JavaScript side, I think like Iceberg kind of offers uh, some similar concept uh, to, to keep track of the change in the warehouse. And I, th I think it's an amazing thing to have. Uh, I've been meaning to write an article for the past five years around like we need a new uh, Hive Meta Store that enables you know for the next generation of databases and data systems to be built on top of. And I think the Meta Store was great contract you know uh, that that allowed you know tools and and systems to talk together, but now it's hurting us because it's not as advanced as it needs to be to build the next generation of tools. I think. We've seen like iceberg come come up and, and solve some of the, the problems that we have uh, around the, the Hive Meta Store. So really excited for this project and this approach and this idea of like keeping track of which partitions are getting mutated in time and, and keeping the ones that are getting mutated um, in the background so that you can, you know, query different uh, points in time of a table. All right. We have a couple of questions here related to partitions. Um, let's see here with... Oh, Keeps going up. With Delta and Iceberg, do you still need to worry about partitions and having to always overwrite the whole partition? Is that view a bit outdated given the new technologies? Um, yeah, there's, I don't know. There's, so there's a hoodie too, you know, there's the idea of like, hey, how do you enable, uh, you know, kind of a transaction log inside of a lake, which is, a, I think, a really interesting idea as well. To me, I'm in a school of thought that the clarity and the simplicity of the model is really important, right? To have this guarantee that generally a tasks mutate one partition is a strong is a strong foundation to build upon. 
Uh, I know this is very like batch centric way of thinking, uh, but generally I think those guarantees uh, are great. Um, and I don't think those should be rules, right? Like where it does make sense to use something like hoodie, like a fast changing dimension as opposed to a slowly changing dimensions. Um, I think it makes sense to kind of break out of that pattern uh, when, when the solution requires to, but it's nice to have that foundation and that pattern in most cases. Thanks, Max. And that is it. Sorry, folks, uh, we are out of time, but Max will be in the Slack subsurface community afterwards. So please continue the conversation there. Thanks again, Max, for a wonderful presentation. This was awesome. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. See you on Slack. Bye. All right, thanks. Thanks again, Max. That was awesome. Lots of lots of great comments. People are wondering if you're going to write a book. 